Okay, here we are. Another episode of The Grail. It will be a guitar episode. It'll be a music equipment episode. It'll probably be a Bay Area type of episode. And uh, I, I really try to steer clear of doing the guitar ones just because I had Grover Jackson on on the first episode and then that was it. Everybody's like, oh man, do this guy and that guy. Like it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't a guitar podcast and I Dude. didn't get mad about it, but after a while it got a little annoying because there's so many amazing people out in the world that I'd like to feature on the grail that build stuff by hand and uh, work outside the box. But when I um, was pitched you from uh, our buddy Adam there from the Pints yeah. Lounge. But of course. I started looking over the uh, the PDF that he sent me. And I was like, oh, I got to have this guy on. You know, it's just uh, because what I'm reading in this PDF, I was like, I've been there the entire time. And there's so many, you know, so much, so much to talk about. So introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi. So I'm Rich Lassner. I'm the vice president of development for Vox Guitars right now. Been there for 17 years, which is a frightening thing to say. I don't think I've ever been in one place longer than five minutes. But yeah, I've been doing it for a long time with these guys. Um, background is I was a musician for a really long time, part of the volunteer poor. And uh, I learned how to build guitars by doing and watching and uh, kind of balance the building things and um, playing music. It was a really interesting experience because unlike some guys, I was out there for years on the road and uh, went through tons and tons of guitars. And it really helped me kind of focus on, you know, what do people need? What do they want? Because a lot of people say like a guitar is like a car. Cars have four wheels and a steering wheel, but new ones come out every year. People are often amazed you have to, quote, design guitars. I think they think it was all done in the late, you know, late 40s, early 50s. And in some ways, they're right. The archetypes do come from them, but there's more to do. Did you grow up in Marin or the Bay Area? Is that what we're talking about? No, the ocean was on the other side, man. I'm from Atlantic City, New Jersey. Oh, wow. I was yeah, just which is a... <laughs> Oh, you were? Yeah, I was doing uh, the casino there with Burr. It was. I oh, yeah. There. Yeah, hard rock. I saw, I saw a clip of that, man. Yeah, I escaped from there way before that all that stuff happened. But um, it's a really weird place to be from because I grew up when it had already crashed and burned before the casinos came in and there was virtually nowhere to play, but tons of really talented musicians there. So we would just like rent a school gymnasium and go crazy, you know, and bands would play all night. And um it really honed my skills. And also I was that guy that when you brought me your melody maker, when it like the neck wasn't right, you know, I go, I'll fix it. I had no idea, dude, but <laughs> they trusted me anyway. And over time I learned how to fix without breaking, which was a pr pretty fun period of time back there. I don't know how old you are. I'm 57, but how old are you? I'm turned 68 two days ago. Scary. Oh, damn. I know. I I know. Hey, man. It just, it's all got to do with when your parents decided they were going to have a kid. So I got no control over that. But yeah, I mean, but music make is sort of timeless. There's a lot of guys in my age group, your age group that are still out there really doing it. Christ, I mean, the Stones are still touring, right? So, you know, up where I am, we've got Bob Weir and Phil Lesh and all the people connected to the dead. Right. Yeah. They're like, they're not kids anymore, but they still got something to say. I just saw them last week, uh, the last show. <clears throat> yeah. And I've yeah. seen Dead & Co. about 15 times. And, uh, you know, when I watch Dead & Co., the amount of Bay Area that just pours over me, the memories of yeah. just from hating the dead to loving them. But everything about that show, the last show at the... Um, and I call it Pac Bell, and it always be. <laughs> it's, it's amazing to think about everything I'm looking at up there, and we can really get into equipment from John Mayer's Dumbles, and oh, uh, yeah. and then of course Bobby with his years of Olympics, and Phil with Olympics, and back with Randall and Boogie, and there's just this history 
of Bay Area and Bay Area equipment, you know, and it's really wild to think about how Randall Smith is probably, and I could be wrong on this, but I'm pretty knowledgeable on amps, uh, could be the first boutique amp company, you know, because you had Marshall, well, yeah. MPEG, and Fender. No, absolutely. I mean, the first time I, you know, I saw Santana's clip from Woodstock, right? And there's a little Princeton sitting up there, but it ain't a Princeton. Yeah. That's where Randy's secret sauce was, you know, and you've got all those guys back from what, Peru Music and Mill Valley. Yeah, Mike Bloomfield teaching guitar, Carlos Santana, um, Randy. I mean, it was crazy, a scene in this little tiny town. And it's still there, you know, like, you know, I lived in Mill Valley when I first got here. I came from Mississippi. I worked for PB, not from there, but spent some good years there. I got there and people are like, oh, you see that music store right there, man? That's where my Bloomfield used to hang out. It's like that kind of energy. The Bay Area is really a special place. I mean, as a kid, I used to grab, I'm from the East Coast, right? So I used to grab like It's a Beautiful Day albums or Moby Grape, you know, later Y&T, like all these Bay Area bands that are just killing that broke out you know some of those bands got had a hit or two in the on the other parts of the states but when i got here the stuff that's in the ground and like i got out here because i was going to run modulus guitars the carbon fiber neck company well, and there, i did that, that was fucking uh bobby played modulus he had the pink one and bobby was part of the company when i got here and we were across diagonally from the the secret dead building that I will not talk about, but everybody knows where it is. Anyway, he, he and Phil would just wander over. You know, I'd, I'd walk back into my office and there's Bob, with one of my guitars going, well, that's pretty cool. Can I borrow this? It's like, yes, oh, yeah. anytime. Man. But yeah, I mean, the gravity you're talking about. It's like every place is special. I grew up near New York City and all that stuff. And there's a, a whole rich history there. But this was always the exotic place when I was a kid that you looked to for the, what was changing, what was new. Yeah, even apps, Randy Smith, guitars, Alembic. I mean, and all these great builders, there's all this little Geppetto's workshop stuff going on here to this day. That Alembic stuff and Randy, you know, I mean, there's even a, a famous, uh, I, I know Gibson just bought it, which was um, Keith Richards' boogie that he used on tattoo you record you know that yeah. classic wicker front with the five band graphic yep. equalizer and yep. you know i was around the factory a lot back then because my guitar player steve mcdonald worked there and oh, wow. uh, and doug west and all the guys and um you know and randy would be there and it was just wild here we are in petaluma and they're busting out these amps and then eventually they go from like Santana and hippies of dead and stuff into Metallica with the double rectifiers and triple rectifiers. Right. And it just becomes like, wait a minute. Now Boogie is the sound of thrash. It's, it's yeah. The, it's, the yeah. history in the Bay area is fucking amazing. And I can't even tell you how happy I am that I grew up there. It's just in me, you know? No, it's it's really it's the secret sauce of the West Coast in terms of amps and guitars. And let's face it, the level of players up here is just ridiculous. Oh. Every every day I run across somebody I never heard of that's playing in like the no name bar in Sausalito or something. You're like, holy hell, who is this person? How did they get to this level? There's always new kinds of music coming out here. I mean, all the fan fret stuff that yeah. came from here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, that was, I remember going to the Luthiers forums like 15 years ago and seeing these guys going, no, this is new, man. This is going to work. This is going to happen. People are going to use this. And everybody's like, nah, it's too weird. And now it's everywhere. So, you know, like I, I was really happening during the time of like the, the, uh, all the speed players, the Vice, the Satriani's, the Paul Gilbert's all, you know, all those guys, I was right in there in that period. And I, I kept wondering, what's going to come after? What's going to change where the guitar is going to go? Because those things still all work. But the reality is they've kind of become classics, like a Vi Gem or an Ibanez RG or an ESP guitar. It's like everybody knows what that is. It's a classic. But then I started to see these guys like uh, Tosa Nabasi, guys coming up with like fan fret eight strings and actually really getting new music out of them. 
you know, and I, I'm hearing all these crazy like thrash guys in Europe using eight string fan fret guitars because they can get the kind of like dark bottom end that that's the only thing that'll do it. So it's really cool that things are still evolving. You and I, uh, I have a deep, deep, long past uh, friendship with uh, Mike Varney. And oh. yeah, so that's, you know, I used right, to fucking yeah. mow his lawn and and paint his fucking house and seriously did construction his house and and we became long lifelong friends he's been on the podcast and uh it was yeah. amazing to think about you know you, you've got your classic players of the 60s you got your claptons your jimmy page uh you know the pete townsend's the um peter greens oh we we know oh, yeah. then you get into the 70s and then you get into kind of Eddie Van Halen and then of course Randy Rhodes and then you get yep. into shrapnel and the the that's when we first hear of the sweet picking of Ingve and then Paul Gilbert Racer X uh um, Bali all, all those guys Steve Vai Greg Howe it, yeah. it, it goes on and on and on but when you really think about it there is only, I was talking about it, there's only like five waves of guitars. You got the Les Paul, the 59, classic. You got right. the SG, classic. You got the Strat and the Tele, classic. And then comes along Charvel. Unbelievable, you know? It. But in the middle, you got the Ibanez lawsuit era, which my buddy still has his Strat. And they made ah. the B, and yeah, he still has it, white Strat. Oh, and yeah. And then, um, you know, the one of the main reasons I wanted to talk to you was 1977-ish. I walked yeah. into a music store in Fresno, and there they are, two Ibanezes. You have the George Benson, yeah. heavily abalonied, and then you've got the Iceman. And right. this is right. kind of when they get off of the lawsuit era and start doing their own shit. Let's talk a little bit about that. Now, were you working at Ibanez? I got there in the early to mid 80s. So right after that, I was working retail in a big store in Philadelphia and they were right above Philadelphia. And I actually didn't <clears throat> know that at the time. Anyway, I start that was a time period where the quality of Fender and Gibson was pretty poor. They yeah. were really expensive. <clears throat> the stuff cost over a grand at a time when that was real money. They weren't made real well. They didn't sound or feel great. And I started to realize that some of the Ibanez stuff that we had there, like the artist guitars that were like double cutaway Les Pauls, yep. were killing. The quality was unbelievable. <clears throat> so I go to work there and they're having trouble. They're struggling with trying to um, get people to believe that they can do original designs that are cool. Because before it was, when I worked retail, it was kind of easy. You pick up a, an Ibanez Strat copy yep. and a, an American Strat at the time. And the quality of the Japanese one was obviously better, played better, felt better, cost a whole lot less. So I, I knew these guys could do it. But when I got there, they were suffering from the like, we don't want any of the original stuff because we're not sure your stuff's legit. So um, I was originally hired as a guy. I was a music teacher and a repair guy. So they pulled me in for the interview. And there's like eight dour looking Japanese guys and one American guy named Bill Ryan, who's still one of my best friends, who looked like Billy Idol at the time. And he's got his arms crossed and he's wearing black. And they're looking at me. And the owner of the company goes, play like Jeff Beck, play like George Benson, play like Jimi Hendrix, play like Peter Green. And I get like five seconds of anything because I'm a guitar teacher, right? So I, I hit it, but they're like, thank you. And I go home and my wife says, what do you think? I said, I'm screwed, man. They were like, didn't move them. Let me stop you for a minute. What is the interview for? To work at Ibanez as what? An artist development or guitar development? New designs? What is it? No, it's really basic. They wanted somebody. I had sold a bunch of their guitars and I knew the, the rep. He, you know, he was telling them, this guy can get it across that the guitars we're making are good. Let's put him on the road. He can play anything for five minutes and he can convince people these things are real because he can make them work. So I signed up for that. And about four months into it, they're trying to figure out, they have a great designer, this guy, Fritz Cata, who I owe most everything to of how to make production guitars. Anyway, um, 
they start asking me questions like, well, what would you do? Like, what kind of guitar would you play? And I'm like, okay, let's think about this. So I just started checking in with all the people I knew and just checking myself and thinking like, people are looking for fast necks, Charvel and Jackson are killing it. You know, they've, they're going in that direction. I think we we could live there, you know? But I, I realized here was my key thing. There is no Mr. Ibanez, okay? Gibson's a guy's name. Fender is a guy's name. Charvel is a guy's name. Gretsch is a guy's name. There's no Mr. Ibanez. How do you personify a brand that has no face? Artists. So I was in the spotlight column. Mike Varney called me one night about two o'clock in the morning at Philly time and says, hey, man, I'm putting you in the spotlight column. I'm like, great. Who are you? Yeah. He's like, don't you remember you sent me a cassette tape? I was playing fusion style stuff, but it was like a million miles an hour. I was getting paid by the note. Right. Like Al and he, all that type of stuff, but fast. Yeah, like McLaughlin, Demiola, right. Holdsworthy and kind of stuff, you know, and I didn't know any better. I didn't realize it was really hard to make money doing that. So anyway, it caught Mike's, you know, ear because he could hear the technique. And at the time, that was the Paul Gilbert, you know, Vi era. So he's like, I don't know what it is you're trying to say exactly, but man, you can do it. So I'm putting you in a column. Anyway, the point of that is when I come to this big you know, realization that there is no Mr. Ibanez, and that's a big part of the problem. It's like, Varney calls me on the phone and says, hey, Rich, man, I know you got this gig at Ibanez now, and I know you're doing a little artist relations, but none of the big boys will play with my guys because they think the music's not valid. You know, instrumental guitar music back then, Satriani hadn't hit yet. And he was the first guy after Jeff Beck and Blow by Blow that actually made money off of an album with no vocals. Yeah, Surfing so, with an Alien, you know, it was like, dude, it's unheard it killed, of. I couldn't believe it got on the radio. Neither could Joe. But anyway, Mark, you know, Mike says, there is Mark Varney, that's his brother, of course. But Mike, Mike says to me, if you can help my guys get real guitars, legit guitars, that would be massive. And I thought, this is the dude that put me in the magazine, you know, that I got some notoriety from that. And I thought, yeah, man, I can help you. So we signed Vinnie Moore, Paul Gilbert, you know, Satriani came through Vi, a ton of those guys. And it it created the, who's Mr. Ibanez? Well, these guys are Mr. Ibanez. Yeah. So it was really cool. Plus they gave me a million ideas. These guys were all virtuoso players. So it's like, you know, dude, if the neck felt a little bit more like this, or, you know, that you rounded the fingerboard or the frets were like this. So that's how, with all that input from all those guys to me being a player, we created, uh, and it's a group of people, right? I, you don't never do anything by yourself like that. But the group of us put together what Ibanez was, and luckily we hit the wave. We nailed the wave. Did you, is this your first gig outside of playing music? Did you, uh, other than a guitar store and stuff, Ibanez working at a company? Yeah, and the reality is like, I was like like a handful of the American guys who work there. If I had been anywhere else, I would have been a sea of people and it'd be really hard for me to like come up. But there, they looked at the, the American dudes as like really creative, but hard to manage, right? Because yeah. we were always tripping on what would be cool and who would be a great player or like a really neat thing. And they're pretty conservative, especially at the time. They're like, slow down, man slow down we're like no you can't slow down this wave is now and they they went for it one of my bosses at the time literally took me to lunch and said i have no idea what you guys are doing but it works so i'm gonna stay out of your way and the only time you'll hear from me is if you screw up that's huge i'll tell you what man ibanez is such a fucking big deal in the guitar world and still not talk about enough. Let's talk a little bit about it. I mean, you know who was one of the biggest Ibanez players and a lot of people don't talk about it is Adrian Smith of Iron Maiden with the oh, Destroyer shit, yeah. too. Man, Absolutely. That fucking Destroyer too was a masterpiece of a guitar. And this guy's playing on the Number of the Beast tour at the yep. highest fucking level of uh, yeah. arenas. And he really, other than Paul Stanley, is the first arena rocker to be out there playing fucking Ibanez, man. It's wild. 
Oh, yeah. And then followed by Phil Collin from Def Leppard. 100%, man. There he is. His, his debut photograph, it. the three pickup model with the fucking, uh, with the. Uh, yeah, the Kaler. Yeah, the Kaler on there, you know, and yeah, and and it was deluxe with the I with the with the abalone around the edges, you know. Let's yeah. talk a little about when you go to Ibanez because my early, um, you know, intro to Ibanez is like I said, I'm in this music store. There's the George Benson. I'm like, God damn, that guitar is sick, and I'm fucking, yeah, yeah. I'm into you know Ted Nugent at the time, right, right, who's playing Berlin. So I'm like, this is better than a Berlin. Look, it's all abalonied up. It's got a cool rubber toggle switch, and yeah, but yeah. the Iceman was the history of the Iceman is really bizarre. There was some really ugly wood ones with the one pickup and the weird bridge. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and but yeah. then Paul, and also what people don't talk about is Bob from Devo was playing the blue. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. who yeah. invented the Iceman and how does that happen? Because it's well, before there were you. Yeah, there are two guys before my time. One is Jeff Hasselberger. He was the American guy that was like the think tank dude. He was over artist relations, advertising, and coming up with new ideas. He cracked the mirror and glued it onto the original Paul Stanley guitar. Mm. He's the guy. And in Japan, Fritz Cato was a designer. And he's just some dude who grew up on an island far down in the south that just had stupid amounts of talent. He came up with the Iceman and the Destroyer, basically looking at like, what can you do to an explorer right. that would be different and hip? And he he took that on one of the guitars, the Rickenbacker cresting wave horn and stuck it on the other side. Yeah. I mean, it's really sick stuff, man. So he's the reason he and Jeff Hasselberger. Hasselberger brought George Benson in. He brought all he brought Paul Stanley. He was my uh precursor, the guy right before me. So he left me this like bed of really cool shit that he had already done with Fritz. Fritz is just this guy that has a million ideas. You know, he was the dude that pulled them out. He he made all the copy guitars too because he would he they had real ones. They showed me something they saw, thought was a real Modern. Wow, when I was there, really? I see this like yeah, I see this huge old brown Gibson case stuck in this warehouse, and I look at Fritz and I'm like, dude is that you got an explorer is that a 58 what do you got in there and he just laughs and he goes it's probably not real but and i pull it out and it is sick as shit it's just unbelievable and he's he's like we don't talk about this all right because they they released one if you remember they did like yep. the they did the explorer the flying bee and the modern before gibson even came out with one i got an original ad with it all three yeah of them. yeah yeah no yeah. 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 i I saw the guitar that they bought for some insane amount of money that they kept hidden in the office in Japan because they were all about it. But it's both Fritz and Hasselberger did all the crazy stuff before me that you're talking about. Now, Gibson, of course, is notorious even right now. They're going after all kinds of uh, builders and all kinds of patents and lawsuits and all that stuff. What was the history of Ibanez because of course Japan and China they just bootleg anything and they never get in trouble. Um, how serious because we all call the Ibanez the early era, the lawsuit eras. And how did that did, were you around? Did you, I mean, you weren't around then, but did you hear like, like, did Gibson just come in and go and Fender like cease and desist and then they had to start all over? Like, what happens? Well, it's really interesting. I, you know, I, I was working retail when that happened. And all I knew at the time is like, we stopped being able to get their copies. So we started bringing in like Tokai and Fernandez who were still doing it until I forget one of them got all their headstocks cut off at the, at the dock because the, you know, they had, they had uh, gone over the line with Fender and Fender wasn't having it. But honestly, inside Ibanez, by the time I got there, that wave was gone. They weren't thinking about it anymore because they were in enough trouble trying to sell things that like people weren't going for yet. You know, because the, the original stuff that they were making before they really landed on the RGs and the gems and all that stuff, um, it, it was kind of half baked compared to like the real stuff like Charvel and Jackson that was coming out. Like those guys were focused on making real American made stuff that kicked ass. And I've been his quality was always good, but like the features didn't really fly over here. So right. 
that's when they started hiring people like me and this guy, Bill Rhyme and Bill Comiskey, who worked with me. Bill Comiskey ended up doing like 22 to 24 years as the VP of senior VP of artist relations at Fender. Wow. So we we had quite a crew, man. And we were all in this together. But we just we realized it's like the stuff the stuff's good but it's not kicking ass the way it needs to and part of it is like it just looks and feels and smells wrong now was there uh of course i live a few blocks from performance guitars where the original gym was made and yeah uh, they're fucking still open man i, walk, I know i walk I by know. them on the way to the gym and it's just there and i'm like one day i looked i go Hey, that's fucking performance guitar. They made the Steve Vai Flames. They made oh, the yeah. gem, the early gem with the absurdly uh, bigger cutaway and stuff. But um, at what point do you get like Steve Vai in there and uh, okay. and start working on the gem with the handle? Okay. Well, this is really interesting because the guitars you're talking about with the flame body and the yeah. super crazy cutaway... They're actually from a guy named Joe Despagny from Long Island who grew up with Steve, right? So I meet Steve and he comes out and like every company in the world's sucking up to him and trying to, you know, get him to do their stuff. And actually Kramer was after him. And from what I know, blew it because he told me, Steve told me this years ago, they said to him, isn't it going to be great when you and Eddie are together in all the ads and we send out you and Eddie? And he's like, it ain't me and Eddie. Yeah. He had his own mentality. He's a really smart dude. He, he knew that shadow, no matter how big Steve's shadow gets, is still a shadow. Yeah. So he was more interested in other people's stuff. So um, we flew out to his house and, and from Philly and just said, what do you want? Exactly what would it take? And we're not talking money. We're talking guitars. Right. That's where I always came from. It's like, if I can't make you a guitar that you wake up at three o'clock in the morning pull it out from under your bed and grin your ass off. I'm not doing my job. So Steve's like, Oh, okay. Somebody's asking me what I want. Cause all these companies have made stuff for him and just throwing it at him. And I'm sure not everybody did that, but that's how he felt. He's like, get, you know, you want something for me. You don't want to do anything for me. So my attitude as a player was, what do you want to play? Like the Jordan so, sneaker. What, what do you want? What's the ultimate yeah, exactly. sneaker? exactly it was like that it's like we're not saying we'll do this you're gonna do this we're like bring it bring it to us so he sends me a couple of the performance guitars a couple of tom anderson's one of one of the green charvels with the huge bandsaw cutaway in it that eventually cracked all the way through yeah. and there weren't there weren't post-it notes yet but he took little pieces of paper and wrote on it frets like this neck shape like this neck joint this way headstock that way so there were like 20 different parameters and we just sat there there's a throat three or four of us and just went okay let's frankenstein this thing and make something for steve and see what the hell comes out did and, he have the handle uh, did he have the handle on the uh idea yeah there was uh tom anderson or a performance guitar it wasn't a monkey grip yet it didn't have the little bumps in it right it was, it was smooth just, it was like a hot dog Right. right. Look like a, you've seen this, right? Look like a hot dog. So um, you know, and he wanted the top four or five or six frets scallop like Billy Sheehan's basis, which is where he saw that. So um, you know, and Steve's smart and he's tough and he won't do something he doesn't want to do. There's no he doesn't have to, right? That's really awesome. But so we made a couple of these things and we made them in Philly and Ben Salem, which is just north. And I flew him out with another guy to Steve's house. First thing he does cuts the strings off, takes a screwdriver, and takes the thing down to the last nut and bolt. I'm there trying to keep my mouth like off the floor going, oh crap. He wanted to see what kind of job we did for him. Wow. Which was fucking cool, man. I mean, like this is a guy. Finish. That kind of stuff, fit and finish. Yeah, he wants, he wants to know if we like kludged all the holes underneath and just jammed the pickups in it, or if we like took our time and really cared about it. Luckily we had done the job, man. So he pulls everything apart and puts it back together and goes, let's talk. Wow. I'm like, oh, shit. Because I'm I'm trying to recover from the near stroke I just had, trying to smile while he's ripping this thing apart. Now, anyway, this is during the David Lee Roth, the Edom and Smile era, right? Yes, it's after Flexible. It's after his own little 
Yeah, he was still living in this little tiny house in Simi Valley, right? Wow. With his girlfriend who turns his his wife for eight years now. Anyway, so, you know, the other thing that was interesting that I should add to this is every guitar company on earth was crawling up his butt, right? Because he's Steve Vai and he was coming, he was coming on hard. So I read in Guitar World magazine about two or three months before Christmas that year, which must have been like 85, maybe that a whole locker full of his guitars in a road case for the raw thing got stolen out of SIR in the Valley. Yeah. Yeah. Gone. All the shit. Right. The so I'm guitar, thinking, everything. Gone. And um, he got so them back I, recently. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. So anyway, it was just misplaced. But anyway, were, the point they was. They were up in an attic at somebody's house. Something screwed up like that. So anyway, I find out his parents' phone number. I don't even know how. And I call his mom up and I say, look, I'm from a guitar company. Yes, they're all crawling all over your son. But here's the deal. I want to make him a guitar for Christmas. And all I want is to know if you will put it under the tree and just say it's from us. Wow. That's it. So all these other guitar companies were trying to like take them out in limousines and wine and dine them. They're salt of the earth people. They're blue collar. They don't go for that shit. They know when they're being brown nosed. So she said, that's all you want? And I said, well, really, I want him to like us. But the reality is, if he just goes, well, that's cool, and I never hear from him, that's it. I don't want anything else. They put it under the goddamn Christmas tree. And i, I that's the first call I get. It's like, okay, what do you want? Wow. Wow. We broke, we broke the ice there. Now, were you responsible for getting an Iceman into the Devo camp? That was before me. Yeah. God, so it's we, crazy, man, to see that. Well, we did make a couple of these like weird blue cloud oh, bodies. Oh, I love things. those, the cloud ones. Yeah. yeah. We, we did at least two of those when I was there, and it was cool. We gave them the Mark Mother spot, and it was just really like some people didn't get Devo. Yeah. Which I thought, I, I, I can't understand. They were like, they were so cool, and everybody actually thought they were really nerdy and weird. It's like, dude, they cut themselves away from everybody else. They were just Devo. It was brilliant, right? So when they said, oh, uh, this guy wants us to make some kind of cloud guitar, they thought I was going to balk because they weren't like million mile an hour players. I'm like, sweet, let's do it. We made a couple of the cloud guitars for them and it was really fun. You know, they they were selling those about a year ago. Somebody started making them for Devo and you could buy them on the website, like that design. Not surprised. I mean, yeah. it was really unique and bizarre, and it just fit with how cool they were. Well, that was during their "We're Through Being Cool" era, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And they come back, they come out with the, that guitar, and I'm just like, "Whoa, what is that thing?" They're on the fucking conveyor belts. We're through yeah. being cool, you know. Awesome, just awesome. But like that was a real sidebar there, and we also had guys like Simple Minds. Oh yeah, you know. Like we got, I, I, I teched at Live Aid, which was just fucking Whoa. unbelievable. Yeah, Whoa. we were, so, you know, they staged Live Aid's rehearsals in our warehouse at Ibanez because we had the square footage to like have Led Zeppelin practice there, have run DMC run their set there. And, you know, we had police outside because people figured it out and it was unreal. So the day of the show, I get there at 630 in the morning. There's not a car on the street. I turn around 45 minutes later and open the curtain. There's 200,000 people. It's awesome. Right next to me, Seymour Duncan, who I grew up around in South Jersey. He's teching. Seymour's teching. I'm teching. There's Jack Nicholson talking to Eric Clapton. You know, oh. it's so no fucking attitude. The only attitude is Sean Penn shows up with Madonna and all our strong guys are shoving us out of the way. We're just laughing because yeah. all the other really great players zero they left their ego at the door there was no ego there you know Man. phil collins comes in on the fucking concord he plays drums in the uk and then he plays drums with zeppelin it was like just insane but yeah. we got to do that because we staged them the night before we had every band there it was unbelievable at any point while you were there of course we were we're talking about now the behemoth of kramer starts to happen with the beretta oh, yeah. Eddie Van Halen leaves Charvel, yeah. or he wasn't really yeah. with Charvel. And you yeah, know, they yeah, had yeah. The, the Kramer Ripley where each, it was a stereo yeah. pickup yeah. and all of that yeah. shit. At any time, did you 
go after Eddie? Well, you know, it's really interesting because, you know, we were in Philly and they were in Jersey. So it was like this cross state kind of thing. We were fighting each other and um, we didn't really know each other at the time. It's weird. Later on, I got to know all the guys there, but it was just like at that time, they were just the enemy. But what happened, um, they didn't really try to go after Eddie. But what happened was when Floyd Rose came up with the locking vibrato, it shoved everybody else into the weeds because they they had an exclusive and we couldn't touch it, right? So um, unfortunately for them, they decided to license it. And we actually at Ibanez, they told us we designed a better Floyd Rose than they had. Wow. But the problem was, and Floyd told me years later, what a nice guy that, that man is, seriously. It couldn't happen to a nicer guy. But he said, you know, the, the, prob the worst thing we ever did is license it to Ibanez because then they were able to kill. Yeah. You know? Like, yeah. can you imagine if we went to Vire Satriani and said, oh, yeah, you can have this guitar, but we can't put a Floyd Rose on it. It would have been see you later. Totally. That, they had that. They had that advantage for a while, right? Kramer had it for a while. <laughs> what was that terrible tremolo you guys had before they Floyd? All of them. Yeah. <laughs> I know, don't even have to. Yeah. I, I didn't knock the uh, Kaler, man. I liked Kaler a lot because, you know, that the early Floyd, you couldn't do a pull up on, you know, right. the first Floyd. Right. And Kaler had the... Um, the uh, fine tuners, which Floyd didn't have yet. My first yeah. Floyd, you had to fucking Allen wrench down the fucking strings. Yep. And then if it was out of tune, you had to undo. Oh, it was yep. a nightmare. But the idea yeah. was amazing, you know? Well, well, I was I was a repair guy at the time that the, un, the non-fine tuner ones hit. And, you know, you had to get a guy in a band that had a tech and had at least one other guitar. Because right. you're going to break a string or it's going to go out of tune and you were screwed, there's a German company that made one with fine tuners before the Floyd Rose. And Kramer was using that for a while. I can't remember. Those guys went nuts and started suing Kramer when they started using the Floyd. But the Floyd was actually a better piece. But we knew we were dead if we couldn't license it. And luckily, we made a great deal with those guys. But as I said, Floyd years later said to me, you know what, man, if we had not licensed it, I'd probably be sitting on top of my own mountain today. And, you know, it was rough, but what a great invention, really. It, guys like Vi and Satriani wouldn't exist at the level they do if they didn't have the expression of that. Though I, I want to agree with you for a second. Can I talk about the Kaler for a second? Yeah, please. I think the, I think the Kaler got a bum rap. I really yeah. do. Um, Paul Gilbert, when he first came to me, we were putting Kalers on his guitars because you could set those suckers to go up to the moon and, and come right back in tune. And Paul had that nailed. They got this weird image that the saddles weren't connected to the bass real well. And like the Floyd was screwed down and people started saying you're losing tone. The reality is some of those guys can make that thing sing. And I know guys today that will buy up the original ones for a shitload of money to put them on their guitars because they have a range and a feel that you can't get out of anything else. Yeah, I really liked them. And you didn't have to go all the way through the guitar, you know, right? just right, to right. the surface. And it, it's funny when you think about uh, Floyd and Kalers, because then you start getting into the Brad Gillis type of like that. Yep. Yeah. You know, that thing, yeah. all yeah. the tricks that were happening with the uh, the better tremolos. It's really wild, man, to think about. Eddie oh, yeah. Halen on the first record is basically using a Strat style yeah. and, and being able, that's the finesse and feel that yeah. he had of being able to keep it in tune, man. You know, people oh, don't wow. understand. Yeah. They go like, oh yeah, Eddie started all the, you know, all of that stuff. But I mean, Hendrix was doing it and everything, but oh yeah, no. what he did was, as soon as he did a dive bomb, he could hit a fucking open E and it would still be there. Yeah, yeah, he was he was amazing. I dealt with him a bunch of times at different companies. The, the natural talent in that guy. I mean, we all know that. That's nothing new. But like, you know, I, I hadn't met him and he was at Kramer. So he was the enemy, right? When right. I was a kid, it's like, I'm an Ibanez. You know, we're going to beat you up. And it's like, so eventually when I got out of that and he got out of all that crap, like, you know, he used to come in the line six all the time because he didn't live far from where we were in the valley. I worked there for a number of years, too. And um, 
he just show up in the morning and I find him in the break room. It's just Eddie, you know, it's yeah. bizarre. It's like, you changed everything in my world. You flipped it upside down. You killed disco. I love you. And yeah. it's like, Hey man, how you doing? It's like, that's fucking Eddie Van Halen. Yeah. He was, he was just like a guy. That's what I, some of these people like George Benson is the greatest player I have ever had the privilege to sit in front of in my life, bar none. And I've been in front of Holdsworth and Eddie all those guys. I used to bring George guitars that we would have made for him. And he lived in North Jersey at the time with this beautiful view in New York City. And I'd bring the guitar. I love that he did this to me. He knew I was a pretty good player. I was good enough to be playing out in like some of the real spots. But he was fucking George Benson. So I bring the guitar. I go to hand it to him. He go, no, Rich, no, cool, man. You play. I want to hear it. Could you pl play it for me? I play about 10 seconds. He go, cool. And he grab it. He just eat my brain. Um, and not trying to, just being him. He would just play something. I'd just be like, okay, well, I got schooled, so I guess I can leave now. He yeah. just, that guy used to, he just ate my brain. And the fact that Ibanez could have him, Holdsworth, Lee Rittenauer, John Abercrombie, John Schofield, even till today. And on the other hand, have the other stable of the greatest modern guys was just that I've never experienced anything like it. You could just sit in the middle that you had all the gods of jazz and fusion and, you know, pr prog rock, whatever you want it. And over here you had Vinnie Moore. That's, that's another guy. Vinnie, Vinnie is still a close friend of mine. I think that he's been underrated for an incredibly long time. I know he's got some stuff with UFO and people know who he is now. And he's definitely had a great career. But when I first met him, he was just a kid that could play his fucking ass off. He would come over to my apartment and just pick up one of my guitars. And an hour later, I'd be going like, okay, I guess I'll just stop like staring at this kid now. But guys like that, we had both stables is what I'm saying, you know. And on the other hand, we had Devo and, you know, the rock guys in England and Phil Collin and all those cats. And it was like, what an experience that was, man. And I was just, I was in my late 20s. You know, it was just ridiculous. Was there any player um, a lot like a Jordan say a, a Paul Stanley that was like, look, I'll come to Ibanez, but I want to cut at the company because I know, you know, Zach Wilde about seven, eight yeah. years ago was like, why am I playing Gibson when they're getting all the money and I'm just right. getting free guitars. I'll just do my own brand. Was there anybody like that? Cause it, Paul Stanley really, to me, put yeah. Ibanez on the map. No, he really did for the modern era of them when it's the I'm not a Les Paul, I'm not a Strap, but I'm still good era. I totally agree with you. Uh, when it came time to sign some of the bigger guys, they would get a deal. They would get either upfront cash or a percentage of how many of the guitars sold. And that was usually a decision they made with their management. But we never got anybody at that time that wanted a chunk of the company. And I, being a Japanese company at Ibanez and it's family owned, the Hoshino family, I would doubt that they would ever feel comfortable with that even today. So, I mean, a guy like Steve or a guy like Benson or a guy like that, they were worth something. So it was, they were willing to make a deal with those guys, but it never included like now you're, you're part of the company. It wasn't like that. So you're at Ibanez and, you know, you did mention PV. At what point do you go to PV? Well, actually in between there is a Yamaha. Oh, well, oh, here we go. Let's talk about this because there's another yeah. underrated gem. And Gary Holt from Exodus and myself there and you go. Kirk Hammett, we all worship yeah. the Yamaha SG3000. And it's all because of Dave Medichetti. Not the yeah. 2500, not the 2000. It's the 3000 with yeah. the full fucking abalone and yeah. the yeah. whole nine yards. And Dave really put that fucking guitar on the map. And if Dave would have been bigger, if he would yeah, have to another yeah. level, the SG Yamaha guitars would have been like right up, there. up there with fucking uh, Ibanez. Well, you know, Santana almost got it there with the 2000s. Yep. I mean, that's like, that hit really hard. We sold a bunch of them when I worked retail. But you got to remember, and I know you know this because you're from the Bay Area, Menachetti, Y&T was massive here. Huge. Okay. Where I was... I knew about them because it was my job to know about them. I got all the local music rags. You know, I got everything from all over the country so I could see regionally what was going on. He blew up like crazy and he got huge in Japan too. So, you know, when I, when I get to Yamaha, um, so meanwhile, here's what happened. So 
I'm at my peak at Ibanez and I know that I can see the other side of the hill. I'm a journeyman, not right now, but I mean, I spent five or six years at Ibanez and then I felt like, okay, I've done the big thing. I've, I've blown the big wad here. It's just like, I need to move on if I want to do more stuff. So I approached Yamaha and they flew two guys out from Japan right to a, an airport hotel lounge. These guys were bleary. And a couple of guys, white guys from California, or Americans, I shouldn't call them white guys. Anyway, they um, they show up at this hotel and they're talking to me about what I want. And I'm a kid, right? And I don't have to leave my job. So I'm asking for the moon. And they're yeah. just writing everything down and shaking their head. And they leave. I don't hear anything. Nothing at all. And I'm just going about my business at Ibanez. Everything's cool. And all of a sudden, this like thick envelope from Yamaha shows up. And I think it's probably a really nice rejection letter and a t-shirt, you know? <laughs> And I open it up and it's a contract with absolutely everything I asked for down, like everything. And I show my wife and I'm like, I guess we're moving to California. Wow. So, yes, yeah, so I came out here and I'm in L.A. We're in North Hollywood and they hired a builder from the Bay Area, this guy named Leo Knapp, who is an insane genius. I mean, this guy, he got pissed because he found out this guy, Larry Robinson, was the best inlay guy in the world. Larry's from up here. Yeah. He never in the lead in his life. Two weeks later, he's doing Trees of Life and insane abalone. And I mean, just crazy. He's that guy, right? Yeah. If he doesn't Some of those do Ibanez is like the one that fucking uh, Bob Weir played. Oh, uh, the Tree of Life. Yeah. Oh, man. those And, and those, it's interesting yeah. that those are called the Bob Weir now. You know, when you see oh. him on Reverb. Yeah, I bought one of the second prototypes that he didn't take from a local Philly music store, not knowing that the guy that owned the store was on the board at Hoshino. <laughs> I like that guitar. And I went to the store in Philly and I said, do you have anything like the, the Bob Weir guitar, the Tree of Life? He goes, how about the second prototype? Wow. Anyway, so I'm, I'm, at, I'm at Yamaha. It's me, this builder, and one guy that's like the manager that they plugged in there from, from Yamaha out here, right? So What year? What year? uh this is uh 89 right oh, 89 so late yeah so i get there in 89 89 and, uh, because now we have gnr and the les paul is back oh, oh yeah right exactly so like i hit about that time so i go there and we're trying to figure out what to do right and my my how i learned how to design guitars was i drew them on paper right or we actually carved them out of clay at ibanez for a couple things so anyway, so um, they said, OK, we want to run a test. Why don't you design a Strat style guitar and a Les Paul style guitar? Knock it out of the park. Anything you want. This is not going to be production. We just want to see if our engineers can translate what you draw and what the builder there builds, because we built these things, too, um, into a production ready instrument. We're going to run a test. OK, cool. So I make the, like a Strat the way I would see a Strat. And I make a Les Paul the way I would see a Les Paul. And they've got some really different features, right? Send it off to Japan. And all of a sudden, some prototypes come back. And they're perfect. They look wow. great. And I'm like, OK, so now we can start doing stuff. They said, oh, no, these are going into production. What do you mean? I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. This was supposed to be like a test of the emergency broadcast system. Right. We weren't. And they're like, no, no, the, 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 the higher ups like this stuff. So I came out, the Strat type thing is called the Pacifica. I remember it's that. Still, it's still one of the biggest selling guitars in the world. Wow. All the way from like 200 bucks to like 1500 bucks. And we signed a shitload of people because I was still connected to all these guys for my artist relations stuff. And the Weddington was named after the street we're on in North Hollywood. And that was the Les Paul style guitar. And that lasted about 10 years, but the Pacific is still out there. And I did it the Billy Sheehan attitude basses, which are still being produced. Wow. And like a neck through six string for John Patitucci for a bass. I, I did all that stuff there. It was really weird because it was like, I would just come up with ideas and they go, okay. And like all of a sudden there'd be a guitar. It was just ridiculous. It was another great experience. I, I don't know if you're hip to Michael Lee Ferkins. Oh, I know player. Michael Lee very well. Yeah, well, he's, he's right up here in Novato, but he was one of the first people that sent me a tape. Actually, Varney sent me a tape of him yeah. and said, I think you're good. I'm like, so I get back to Varney. I'm like, this guy's the best slide player I've ever heard in my life. And I'm a Dwayne Allman freak. He's like, yeah. none of that slide. Whoa. All of it's the whammy bar. I'm like, that's impossible. There are notes moving together and going all over the place. He's like, trust me. 
So like that was my first guy. And then people like Buckethead started showing up. Yeah. So it was, a, it was a really wild ride there. And they showed me a couple of guitars they had made for Vi that he sent back. Wow. It was like a 32 frick guitar with like the pyramid with the eye on it for the headstock. And it was buried in their vault. And it's like, whoa, you guys really went after it, but it did not work. When I was uh, shooting the documentary on Limp Bizkit, um, Yamaha came after Wes and Wes started, uh, he designed this crazy hollow body that they were making for him for a yeah. while. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, the, the, the crazy thing with, um, <coughs> that's, that's my dog barking in the background. I think the gardener just showed up. Oh, yeah. Um, can, can I, can I fail for two seconds to close the door? Yeah, yeah. Don't pause it, though. Just get I'll yeah. just let it go. Yeah. Sorry about that. I just got to make sure oh. the dog's in here. It's all good. Peter's in. Stay. Stay. Dog break. Come here, Gertie. Come here. Get over here. Come sit with that. Get over here. Get over here, Gertie. Come on. <clears throat> Come on. Go ahead, go out, go, go, good girl. Sorry about that, dude. It's all good. Didn't expect him to show up. Oh, okay. so, so anyway, you're talking about the whole limp biscuit thing. Yeah. Um, ba back when I was still at Ibanez, I ha I had made myself an eight string acoustic guitar. I think there's a picture of it in that um, PDF because I was playing in a band with an upright bass player and a piano player. And the piano player would chord like this, you know, with this like four octaves between notes and this huge sound. And I'd go to comp on my six string and it would go, you know, much less range. So I designed this guitar as an eight string to have an extra low note, extra low string and a high string, which isn't the way people do it today. Pretty much. They have two low strings anyway. So if I comes over my apartment in Philly, and we're hanging out and he sees the guitar. He picks it up and he goes, man, if I had that low note, with David Lee Roth. Yeah. I mean, it, it would absolutely kill. And I'm like, how about I make you a seven string? H just too many. So I go back to the shop after he goes home the next day, he goes up to see his parents in New York and we're, we're cutting Floyd roses apart and like screwing them back together. So they have seven strings and we're talking to DeMarzio. We're like, cut a couple of your bobbins and make us two seven string humbuckers. We cut the Floyd Rose nut and make it into seven strings and we cobble together a seven string guitar. And um, that's the universe, the, the gem universe guitar, the seven string they still sell. So we give it to Steve and it like changes the landscape. All of a sudden people like, you know, Wes Borland, all those guys, all the low, man. All, yeah. All the low note bands, man. All that dark, heavy stuff. I yeah, mean, that guitar was the king of that, man. Dun, 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 dun. Oh. What, what, well, the thing that was interesting is like it didn't sell when it first came out because it was too weird, right? It's like yeah. m there was no music for it. People weren't creating for it. Vi used it on an album and it was cool. But after that, nothing until Wes got a hold of it, until Korn got a hold of it. And then it became epic. You know, it became this huge thing. So anyway, I'm I'm at I'm at Yamaha. I do those two things and I'm thinking, OK, well, I didn't think I was going to like like make the major stuff happen right up front. Let so me ask you a question before you go further. While yeah. you're at Yamaha, do yeah. you ever at that moment reach out to Dave Medichetti and go, let's do a, a Yamaha 3000 Dave model? Well, you know what? It's like the people at Yamaha and Buena Park down in, in Orange County. Yeah. I don't, they had had some contact with them at some point and they, they kind of felt like there was no gas left in that motor. Wow. So they just switched. It sucked for me because I knew who he was and they, they were dissuading me. For, they're like, we tried already. OK, so, you know, and they showed me some of the stuff they gave and it was wrong. It wasn't a, an SG. It wasn't even close to a 3000 that somebody had just missed. Somebody had been off the mark and they kind of told me, you know, we, we kind of hoed that row away already. Don't go back there, which sucked for me because I, I was so hot on getting YNT happening, having known who they were. And I thought they needed much wider recognition. I thought it'd be really cool if he had ads and we sent him out and people knew who he was. They, you know, it was kind of like I got there after the door closed on him. Right, right. Yeah, which kind of So sucked. you leave Yamaha and then you go to PV, which by the way, 
me yeah. growing up in the music scene, PV was always ghetto. Like, you yeah, know, yeah. Skinner yeah. played PV and the whole right. stage was PV, but nobody played PV. They had the PV, I think it was the Bandit or something like yeah. that. The yeah, bandit, it's yeah. like a practice. 12. Amp. But no one, man, if a band, this is how the reputation of the 80s, if a band showed up at Soundcheck with PV, you would go yeah. like, these guys suck. Yeah. And you haven't even heard them yet. No, totally true. Because the store that I was in was a PV dealer. Yeah. And it was sort of like, no, people were looking for Marshalls. People were even looking for Ampeg or Fender Amps at the time, especially East Coast, because Ampeg was there. But yeah, like PV was like, you could get a bass amp bigger than a refrigerator for 500 bucks. Yeah. But you got what you paid for at the time. But the, the interesting thing is I knew a guy that was running the product development down there. And he actually lived just outside of LA and he used to commute there. And I lived in LA at the time for Yamaha. So he was, he was trying to convince me to go there. So he would take me to these really fancy restaurants all the time and, you know, like buy me a million dollar lunch and say, you could do whatever you want. You know, I'd be your boss and be really cool. And I'm like, yeah, well, I'm a kid from New Jersey. I, I just don't know how that's going to flush down there. Anyway, he said, just give it a shot. So I flew down there. And of course, Hartley isn't anything that anybody thinks he is. The, the kind of image that he's created, he's one sharp son of a bitch. I mean, right. you don't grow a company like that. He Basically, what he did is he provided like working class players with an amp that would do it. It wasn't sexy. It like you said, like that you saw that back line in a club, you went, uh oh, right, this is gonna suck. But you know what? All over the South, I, I started to appreciate can't afford a fender twin, but you can afford a a, a hundred watt deuce, you know, a yeah. PB deuce. And it's gonna work. All so, the country I, bands started playing, which was a wise move, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the other thing that happened, so I, I get down there and this is a different gig for me. I'm a division manager. I'm managing the amp, amps and the guitar. So I'm not the designer on this gig. But, you know, Hartley said to me, you know, he put the whole thing of amps up in front of me. And he said, what would you do if you were going to, like, change this so that it was more modern? What would you do? I kind of blew his mind. I'd say, they're ugly. They're wrong. They look like PV. You got to get rid of the metal things. You got to get rid of the chicken head logo. You know, the, the color knob thing is really, it's not happening. You really, I said, the stuff that's inside of there, people would appreciate it a lot more if it came in a sexy package that they thought was really cool. So he said, what? So we went out, we bought a boogie, we bought a Fender, we bought a Marshall, we bought a couple of other cool looking amps at the time. We put them all up on a stage and we just, you know, brought him in and brought in a bunch of the, the management people and said, what do you see? What's the coolest looking amp up there? And it wasn't his amp, of yeah. course. So um, we redesigned the whole way they looked so that they looked like guitar amps. And we we upgraded what was in them. We also did the classic series, which was the tweed tube thing. Yeah. Which actually, they sound amazing. They're pretty, they're outrageous. The amp designer there is one of my best friends now. His name's James Brown. <laughs> wow. Wow. From, from Mississippi. He is incredible. He's the he's the head designer at 5150 for all the Eddie amps. Oh shit. It's that guy. He's yeah. the shit. The guy is the shit. Anyway, he had great ears. And after he challenged me a bunch of times to make sure I wasn't full of shit, we got really tight. And we would sit there and we do stuff like what what somebody want to feel in a tube amp after they hit hit a really big chord and then you know mute the strings. It's like that air suck. That that thump at the end of the note that a tube amp does that you don't get from a solid state amp. So we started evaluating all their amps and he came up with a solid state circuit that breathed like that, which was outrageous. So we put out a whole line of their solid state amps with that and people were going, damn, these things sound real. So we sold the crap out of that. And then we did when I was there, we did the 5150 combo. Killer. They, had all they had already done the 5150 head. Yeah. So. I, I just want to tell a super quick Eddie story because I used to have to deal with Eddie all the time. So, okay, they fly him out there on Hartley's private jet. Yeah, first mm. of all, before you go there, he starts, you know, it's Music Man. Eddie had a weird era, Music Man, and then PV. And also you're like, Eddie's with PV? You just can't even fucking believe it, you know? But 
Right. And he, would right. Go, he would go where they would listen and build what he wanted to build. And his yeah. was genius. So go ahead. I just wanted to get well, into. Well, the other thing is like Eddie, Eddie knew James Brown well before I got there. They had already done the 5150 amp, the head. And yeah. it was outrageous, right? So I get there and there's a bunch of 5150 heads being developed. There's like a couple of Marshall Plexis. Guess who those are like? A couple of Soldanos. Yeah. Which is really what the big impetus was for Eddie's 5150 amp. And a couple of like Bogners and other sort of unusual shit. So um, that's where that stuff came from. And James Brown and Eddie got along unbelievably. I mean, he ended up being the head designer at 5150. Right. So that's pretty serious. But anyway, incredible ears, incredible hands. So I have to deal with Eddie because we're about to do the combo. Right. So um, Hartley sends his private jet and here's Eddie. He lands in, you know, Meridian, Mississippi, from where he lives. He gets off the plane. He's got a case of O'Doul's. Oh, he's fuck. not he's not free, like not drinking, quote unquote, for a while. Right. A You're case, in a town. A case. A case. Of non just just uh, with some water or something, but nah, it's uh, still, yeah. He's got to get the taste, right? So he's walking around all the different like manufacturing plants and people are going ape shit because it's Eddie and he's got a, what looks like a beer. Yeah. Right. And people are like, whoa, you can't come in. He's like, it's Eddie. It's not a beer. You're okay. Anyway, so Hartley calls me and says, I'm taking the plane. I got to go to Florida. I'm having a problem down there at some house he was building. Right. And I'm like, uh, uh, okay, what do you want me to do with Eddie? He's just uh, whatever he wants, just hang out with him. You don't just hang out with Eddie. So he's staying in the fucking Holiday Inn oh. in Meridian, Mississippi, right? Ah. There's a lounge, there's a lounge act. It's like some girl singer and a guy with a Casio keyboard playing like really bad versions of the tunes. So Eddie gets out of the elevator and it, it empties out right behind this bar. Somebody yells, it's fucking Eddie Van Halen. The, the horrible duo starts doing jump. Wow. Like a Farfisa kind of version of jump yeah. on a girl singer. Oh my God. He's laughing. They're crowding around. They're trying to buy him beers. And I'm like, no beer, man. He doesn't. And they're like, what do you mean? And he doesn't want a beer. Yeah. So he had, he had his case of old duels. We're walking around and he's getting bored. You don't want Eddie to be bored, man. Oh. So, so he wants me to take him somewhere. There's nowhere. So I end up in the Holiday Inn, sitting in the bar, just listening to Eddie's story for like an entire day and a half, which was incredible. But I felt really bad for the guy. And then yeah. Hartley comes back and they just kind of suck him into the vortex. But I mean, when I'm thinking that elevator door is going to open and we're not going to make it to the street. I mean, there's no way once people figure out who this guy is. So like everybody in town knew he was there. You couldn't go wow. anywhere without people mobbing you and following you around like he was a magnet or something. It was cool, but that's, we worked on, we worked on his guitar, the version, the similar guitar to the one that Music Man had. Yeah, yeah. Ster I knew Sterling Ball really well, and, and he and Hartley were best friends, and he kind of handed off Eddie to him. There's no bad blood, nothing, and actually it was kind of like, we've kind of done what we can do here. He wants to go with a company that can do his amp and guitar. Right. And we can't do that. We're not making amps anymore, so... um you know, enjoy. So that was really wild. And Eddie's there literally, um, the designer guy that I worked with, who's now the head designer at Gibson for years, um, he had drawn a shape that he thought Eddie might like for his guitar. Eddie and Hartley are standing there, both with an old duels and a pencil. And they're like erasing shit and moving stuff around. That became his Wolfgang. Wow. That's fucking... I just watched. Yeah. It's funny when that guitar came out, because I, I played it and I was like, Oh, this thing's great. Just felt like an yes. old Charvel. The neck nailed an old Charvel. It was great, yeah. And then, you know, Eddie always loved Les Paul, but he didn't play yeah. him because he played, you know, the, the yeah. Charvels because of the tremolo and everything. So it had that back Les Paul kind of feel. And, and you know, yeah. it was wild. All of a sudden, PV was on the fucking map. Isn't that so, crazy? Yeah. Well, yeah. And I'm there while that's happening. Right. Because, you know, I grew up on my like you. It's like, oh, really? You bought me a PV? Thanks a lot, Dad. You know, it's like you look lame. It's a shame because he was trying to do something good. But the mentality didn't flush where we grew up. Right. Yeah. We were we were around all the crap where you could buy a Marshall or a Fender or a boogie, whatever you wanted. You could get it in, in a music store and you couldn't do that down there in the South. You know, it was few and far between. And that shit cost real money. So um, 
But I mean, what a transition. So I'm there when Eddie lands there, which is a fortuitous, massive moment. So he's in the middle of this giant warehouse with a couple of 5150 combo protos that are all a little different and James Brown and me. So I get to listen to Eddie play for like two and a half days. Wow. Just noodling around. And I'm like, mind blown. As yeah. you can see, a lot of my gigs end up with me, my mouth on the ground going, holy crap. Of course. So, I mean, to be around that guy, holy shit. It's insane. Just quick, well, so anyway, the designer's name was Jim DeCola. He's now one of the senior guys at Gibson, and he's a really worthy dude and a fantastic designer. I just want to give him that little shout out. But um, so so I'm a PV, and all this crazy stuff is happening, and I get a phone call. Okay, who's this guy? It's um, it's the owner of Modulus, which the guy was a friend of mine, Jeff Gould, and he's like, um, I'm getting out of the company. I just, I, you know, I got to go. It's been a number of years. I got to do other things. And um, there's a guy that wants to buy it. What do you think? And I'm like, what do I think? I don't know. It's your, it's your business, dude. That sounds kind of creepy, but maybe interesting. I don't know. So I find out that there's this guy who shall remain nameless because he would like to be. He's Bob Weir's best friend. Wow. Bob had invested in Modulus. But Bob used to go out on tour, make a shitload of money, come back, spend all of it, and then just keep going. Jerry had just died a few weeks before I'm um, doing this, right? Well, I'm hearing about this. And this guy's worried that Bobby's just like pissing money into the wind. But he looks at the company, he goes, this is some interesting shit. These guys invented the graphite neck guitar and bass. You know, this, this could go somewhere. He decides to buy the company. And Jeff Hasselberger, back from my Ibanez days, vouches for me to become the CEO. Wow. So I'm sitting in Meridian, Mississippi, just coming off the Eddie thing, going, wow, that's not going to get any better than this. Next thing I know, it's like, hey, dude, you want to move to the Bay Area and run a guitar company for Bob Weir and, and friends? It's Absolutely. Like, holy, holy shit. So I knew Bobby because of the Ibanez guitars. Even though that guitar is in the past when I worked there, when the dead would play Philly, they'd play the arena. He'd take a goddamn cab 30 miles north of where we were and just hang out. Wow. Yeah, he, know, loves, he loves gear too, man. That's a Oh, lovely. man. Well, yeah, he's just a cool guy, you know? And um, He's playing so Vox he, now, the fucking two uh, Fawn yeah. AC-30s. Uh, yeah, I got those for him. Absolutely. They, they kill. So yeah. anyway... Um, so I've known Bobby for a million years is all I'm saying. So I came out and I, I met the guy that was financing. And of course, we went to Bobby's house. And he's like, you're that guy I've known for a million years from Ibanez. I'm like, yeah, right. And he's like, oh, shit. So he vouched for me, right? And this guy hired me and I spent eight years there. It was just unbelievable. These are the people, you know, the idea came out of Alembic for the right. Graphite Nick. It was actually Rick Turner who just died recently, who did Turner guitars. He's like the ground zero for almost everything, including Alembic and Modulus and Zahn and all these things that happened out here. He like he was sort of like the hidden genius dude. So he figured out the graphite neck. So I called him and said, Rick, should I do this? I mean, is this cool or is this a sinking boat? And I should really just stay where I am because everything's healthy. He's like, I think you could do something for these guys. So I came out here and... Um, again, I decided there's no Mr. Modulus. So I, I set my sights on flea. Flea. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Shit. I'm like, who's, who's the, at the time and now who's one of the most happening bass guys who has the kind of impact that only guitar players have usually yeah. this cat. So, um, this woman doing my artist relations, Jane McNall at the time took yoga classes in LA on the weekend. Don't even ask me how, cause she lived up here. He was in the yoga class with her. Wow. She got to know him because they were just both there for yoga. He was just another guy. So she brings him to us. And of course, I call Sterling Ball again, because just like the Eddie thing, flees his guy. Right. And I'm like, I, I don't. Oh, what happened to me there? Uh oh. Did I disappear? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. I don't know what happened. Let me. Uh, that's really, oh, there I am. Yeah. I just, I evaporated. God said no. Okay. So anyway, <laughs> yeah, not you. So anyway, I get him on the phone. Cause I, I'm like, I, I'm a, I don't want conflict. 
and they're way bigger than me. I mean, if they're not massive, but they could they could get mad. Anyway, he said again. He said, you know, Flea's a tremendous guy. We love him to death. He's been using a music band forever, and uh, but he's been trying jazz basses as he's been doing a couple of other things. And he said, you know, if he decided that he would want to do something with you guys, that's that's okay. So I got Sterling to not be, you know, made sure he knew what was happening and that he wasn't going to be angry. But um, so, you know, we got a hold of Flea. And again, you know, I just I said to him, what do you need? What aren't you getting? What right. would make your life better? You know, because you can get any base you want. You can get any guy in L.A. or anywhere to build you something. What would be different? So we basically made him a combination of like a jazz bass and a music man with a graphite neck. And we developed um, a three coil pickup for him with Bartolini. That was just fucking unbelievable. This thing would punch you in the head so hard. You got knocked out oh. and he, he, it was unreal, man. Cause he, I mean, the guy can do pretty much anything he wants. He's a great player, but it, it made it for him. It made it so that he was free to play the kind of shit he wanted to. And so my kid at the time was, eight nine he's 35 now i hate to tell you well he came he came up with the ad campaign we did five pages of a picture of his flea with no shirt on with just part of a base you know his hat the whole thing and at the, in the end it says freedom of expression my kid came up with that that whole idea and flea's like that's the shit Let's do that. So we ran that campaign. It was the biggest ad bass player magazine had ever seen. And we sold zillions of those bases. It was Crazy. amazing. Crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. but as you see, like I keep, wherever I go, I try to focus on the impact of what can this company actually do to separate itself from the guy next to me? Music man's the shit. I worship their bases. Their guitars right. are incredible. I think they're the finest American made production guitar right now i mean sarah is incredible collings is incredible but for like long-term unbelievable quality and playability for me it's it's music man I, i've worshipped them forever anyway so we had flea and he brought dave navarro to us he brought all his friends to us so all of a sudden we weren't just a company that made basses for the the jam band deadheads right suddenly we got flea and then we get you know jeff ament you know, in Pearl oh, Jam. Yeah. Holy crap. I mean, we get guys like that who are suddenly waking up and going, this shit's really good. So it was a really cool time, man. It was really cool. I got to tell you, Vox, uh, I've had a lot of amps. I think the greatest amp ever made for me was the AC-15 Fawn with the black panel. And I owned the original one. It was my amp. I also had the AC-30 Fawn yeah. black panel yeah and i became obsessed with them because you know there was that time where mark sampson was making a reliable match the matchless was the reliable version of an ac30 and of course uh tom petty and oasis they were playing vox and and i got yeah. one it was incredible and yeah. i think for me the ac30 and the telecaster is the greatest wow. jangly singer songwriter sound of all time. There's no better. There's no better than that, man. You know. Yeah, it, yeah it's 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 really interesting because to me, in the old school way of looking at things, you got four groupings of amps. You got Fender. You've got um, you got Boogie, which yep. created their own channel. You have Marshall, and you have Vox. Yep. And out of out of those amps, the most unusual one that's uh, to me is the most personalized sounding one is the ACs, the 15 and the 30. That's, you know, it's weird. I've got an AC 50 sitting in the other room right now. Oh, un unplayable. So loud. <laughs> oh, my, a 30 will a 30 is too loud. A 30 I, I have, is too loud. It's way 15 is almost too loud. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So so this 50 is sitting in like a 12 by 12 room. It's got a power attenuator on it, dude. I will rip my face off with that amp. But the, the 15 and the 30s, you have original ones or hand-wired uh, model? I did, I did. I sold them. But my oh. my dream is to get the hand-wired AC30 tan, you know, because they, oh, yeah. Yeah. 
they started making the hand wires and I was like, Oh God, I want one of those, you know, but the, I have the originals, originals and I would gig with the AC 15, man. And it That's was brave. And That's I know because <laughs> at any time they could melt down or it could get damaged yeah. by some fucking guy walking by, you know, the Tolex was perfect. Oh man. But you know, the other crazy part about the original sixties ones, like you had is yeah. they use a preamp tube called an EF 86. I don't know if you ever had to deal with that. That's a tube that if you, if you breathe on it, it shatters. <laughs> it's, you can't move the amp much or you're going to have a problem. And it's, I believe it's the first preamp tube. So the whole damn thing shuts down. Right. So when they started to make the hand wireds again, about, you know, 15 years ago, um, the designer, this guy, um, uh, Dave Clark, who's still there, he decided they have original ones, obviously. So he decided I'm putting the EF86 in there and I'm going to wrap it in. It's going to be on a shock mounted tube socket and it's going to be wrapped in like anti vibration insulation and it's going to work. It does to a certain extent. Yeah. I've had a couple of those. They sound really amazing. They sound like Tom Petty. They sound like the kinks. They have all that shit going on, but you move that thing and you are, you are in trouble, man. It's going to give you trouble. So the newer ones have a 12AX7 in there, but they worked really hard to give it the same jangle and the same exact, and the Brian May sound. Oh, that's, yeah. all in, that's all in that tube, you know? And also if, if you stop for a second and think of the massive width of tones that come out of that, you got Brian May, which yeah. is one of the most singular guitar tones of all time. That's just a goddamn AC30 and a treble booster, right? Thick. And, which is the key. The treble booster and old British shit is the key yeah. to making that amp sing. But anyway, and then you've got all these modern guys with the jangle sound, like the, you know, the Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. And um, the thing can do a million different things, but it is a very specific tone. It is. Which Mark Sampson nailed. Mark did. did the matchless stuff. The Chieftain and all those amps were like, it's a Vox that doesn't break. Now, the modern ones don't break. They got that nailed. But there's just something about an original one. I like to smell the amp too. I'm sorry. Oh, I mean, I do too. Like an old Fender Tweed or a Vox amp or a Marshall yes. Plexi, it's got a damn smell. And that smell better be there if I'm in the room with this thing, because that's part of the experience. They should bottle yeah. that as a spray, man. You know, like they have new like new car smell, you get old amp smell. Well, hey, I think three different ones you could get yeah, guitar Marshall case, guitar yeah. case. You know, oh, old the guitar vintage. case. Yeah, yeah. When you open wow. the vintage guitar, then you and then yeah. and then Martin guitar smell, and then Vaughn yeah. tubes burned in smell. That's our next business, man. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna do this together. But yeah, I mean, there's 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 something about the overall experience. I mean, I can tell you're a, you're a gear nerd too. It's yeah. like seriously, that AC50 is from 1965. I still find myself sitting in the room sometime before I turn it on and go, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's that's real. That thing is real. It's been around the block a few times. That's so funny. You mentioned the guitar case smell. Oh, yeah. I, I opened um, a 58 Junior, Les Paul Junior, in a chipboard case the other day that belongs to a friend of mine. We both just sat there in the room going, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like this. Yeah. Look. Yeah. 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 It's, 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 you can get that into it, you know, but any, anyway, so I digress, but yeah. yeah. So at Vox, the, the, the challenge for me at Vox has been, okay. Vox guitars were a niche thing in the sixties, cool. you know, they made some of them in England, but they made really weird shapes like the teardrop and the phantom and the pickups were microphonic and the hardware was kind of half-assed and the Italian ones were actually more together but, you know, most of the hollow bodies were fully hollow. The pickups squealed. They were bold on neck 335s, which is awfully strange for Americans, right? So it was like, I had to kind of weed through who Vox is and decide who Vox should be. And that wasn't easy. It was like, okay. So we decided, they tried really hard to innovate, however crazy it was. I mean, they put wah-wah pedals in guitars. They put fuzzes in guitars, right? Didn't necessarily give you the best thing on earth, but it was something different. They were trying to find a spot. So I thought, okay, we came out with the Virage back in 15 years ago. And it was a semi-hollow guitar that was smaller than a 335, but I bent it in both directions like a Strat. 
you didn't know it was happening, but you put it against your body and it hugged you like a Stratocaster. It, but it looked like a 335. So all of a sudden I had these guys and we did the geometry to be kind of halfway between a Gibson and a Fender. So I don't know which camp you fall in, but I was a Gibson guy my whole life until I was in my 20s. I had to figure out why can't I play a Strat? Why does it feel so weird to me? It came down to the geometry and how close the strings are to the face of the pickguard. Gibsons are far away. There's a lot of room for your picking hand. Fenders are right near the pickguard and right above the pickups, and there's no neck angle. So the guitar sits straight where a Gibson sits back. Anyway, I had to deal with that. So we created this guitar that automatically bent around you and felt comfortable, and it had 25-inch scale halfway between Gibson and Fender. So both guys or, or girls could feel comfortable on this thing. So we felt like that's what we're trying to move things forward for Vox. What would Vox do? So we've been doing a lot of innovative stuff like that. And we're in the middle of uh, bringing back some solid bodies from the 60s, but making them professional level instruments. They look really cool and they've got they cast the shadow of those old sort of like nerdy, weird uh, Italian guitars. But they play like a great American made guitar. Well, Vox is fucking another thing Vox has going for him is they're king of the hipster, you know, like, oh, I'm, yeah, you look at like uh, Velvet Underground or right now, Brian Jonestown Massacre, who's one of the right, greatest right. bands ever. They are out there fucking rocking the Vox 12 strings and the oh, yeah. AC 30s. This shit is uh, it's yeah. a it's a it's a vital, vital tone, man. Um, uh, yeah, it's cool. They always played Vox, too, from the jam. You know? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and and it's just the Vox sound and the Vox wall, man. I mean, it's they, in, like, they invented it. Yeah, it's yeah. fucking crazy how great Vox I is. Know. And, and you know, and the AC thirty, like I said, it was it's just the sound, man. That's Tom Petty, man. Oh, absolutely. Well, the wild thing about the Wawa, which I'm sure you know, is it was originally supposed to honor a trumpet player yeah. named Clyde McCoy. Yeah, and yeah. the original ones have a drawing of him on the back of it. And I remember getting one as a kid, right? And going like, what the fuck? Yeah. What, what do you, it's supposed to be like a plunger on a, on a trumpet. Yeah. It's like, you're, you're kidding me. So then I try it and I'm like, oh shit. Yeah. Oh my I God. Then I hear Clyde McCoy wall right now, but from Clyde, you know? Oh my yeah. God, that guy. Yeah. Fuck. That's a wall, man. That's a wall. Yeah. I was just it's, talking it's, about Waz yesterday on my podcast. Like, oh yeah, Peter Takasaki has his own fucking yeah. wall now, and I'm like, yeah, right. Who, who knows who that guy? I mean, I know, but who knows who that guy is? Right, we're in the biz, so we know who he is. But I, I know. But it's like you know, we've done a couple of like artist like short runs of Wawa pedals. But it's like the funny part is you got Vox and you got Dunlop. Yep, and Dunlop's got Crybaby. Right. And we, we've got the Vox Wah and they're, they're both like pushing as hard as they can. What can you do with a Wawa pedal? Yeah. Who can use one? What can you change? My kid, who's a ridiculously great player, who's down in L.A. right now working with a couple of bands. He works for Dunlop. Right. And oh, yeah. they have a they have a Wawa pedal the size of a wallet. I, I, I saw that those baby wads. Crazy. It kills. It kills because it fits on your pedal board without screwing everything up. He just, I just put a pedal board together for him right before he left. So he'd have something for his gigs down there. Yeah. And he gives me this Wawa pedal. that's like the size of an ice cream sandwich. I'm like, what the hell is this? He's like, plug it in. Yeah. It, it kills. You but know yeah. what I love? I love, this is my favorite wall of all time that Dunlap did. The five switching ones. So you got yeah. all the different ones. So, cause I love the Curtis Mayfield era wall of the different. long throw, the seventies porn, you yeah. know, the wah, wah, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And yeah. man, that fucking five selector wall was unreal. Yeah. I had one of them. Yeah, definitely. But you know, Vox makes a whole bunch of them and Dunlap does. And it's like, who would have thought when it first came out that there'd be like more than one? Yeah. I <laughs> that know. You could actually do something else with a wah wah pedal, but they got it nailed. So yeah. So what we're trying to do with the guitars is follow in that, that innovation, you know, Vox had a treble booster back when I didn't know what a treble booster was. I didn't want to get, I didn't, I didn't tell you, I didn't want it to be brighter. I didn't I know that it, it boosted ice pick, man. Ow. That's why I what, love AC 30 with a telly. Cause it, it, it brown. Oh, man. Well, yeah. The thing I remember when uh, Mike Matthews started Electro Harmonix, I was around New York city as a kid 
And I remember getting Hullabaloo magazine, which turned into Circus magazine. And for $9.95 and 25 cents postage, you would get an LPB1 power booster in the mail. And it was essentially a treble booster. And I had two of them plugged into the front of a 68 SG. Oh. Pretty much blew up any amp you put it in. But I had the Leslie West tone for years. Yeah. Not knowing that that was all just coming out of his fingers, you know, but uh, yeah, all that stuff is so cool. When guys like Mike Matthews just popped up and went, yeah, let's mess everything up. Let's give you shit you've never had before. Yeah. You know? yeah. I enjoy that. I enjoy people that like mess up what's normal and do something great. Do you have any um, old shit around like old gems and Iceman's and SG 3000s or did you just sell it as you were going around? Well, you know what? That's really interesting because there was a time when I first got out here from Mississippi where I was dragging along a bunch of RGs and some gems and, um, you know, stuff from everywhere I worked. And I had a pile of it and I, I looked at it and I went, that's like looking at old photographs. Yeah. I started to feel it's like somebody else can get something out of this. They're my they're my kids that have grown up and left. I really yeah. need to like push them forward. So the other thing I did is my son. Uh, is a great player, like I said. And I had a whole pile of older guitars and other things laying around. I used to take them in, in the music room and go, someday all this will be yours, son. And I remember one day I, I decided, what, the hell, what am I doing? He's the player now. He's the guy that's out there. Yeah. So I took him in the room and I said, remember that? I said, someday? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, it's today. Yeah. Okay. So I you know, paid it forward to him. So, and he gets use out of them and he, and he got rid of the stuff he didn't need, which I couldn't do. I'd look at it and go, oh, I can't sell that. That's one of the first RGs, you know, or I, uh, no, I can't do that. That's, you know, if I, if I tried that guitar out, you know, and I decided, dude, I can't live in the past. I need to yeah. be now. So the only guitar I kept strangely enough is a 73 guild F412 12 string, which Where? is the most, it, uh, well, it's, it's the most insane guitar I've ever owned. It's never had a neck adjustment. That's and I, I I toured the world with this thing half a dozen to a dozen times. Nothing ever happened to it. And I just decided that's my good omen, man. And so like right now I've got, I don't know, maybe 10 guitars, 11 guitars, but they're just coming and going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, same, like, same with me, you know. I mean, I own two of the greatest guitars in the world. I don't own them anymore. 52 Telly and a, oh. a, a 60 uh, Telly Custom that uh, Fashanti Ooh. plays now. But oh wow, yeah, those were the two greatest guitars I've ever known. And the first year, Tom Murphy fifty nine. Um, oh, awesome! Yeah, awesome. like nineteen ninety five. The the yeah. aged one, the first age, the first hundred that they did. But I don't own any of them anymore. And you know, I miss them, but I, I don't play anymore. I do comedy, so I just miss them more for the uh, the fifty two. I miss the most because it was probably the best fifty two I ever played in my life. Wow. Wow. But other than that, you know, I just love gear. Now, these days, I love gear as uh, pieces of art in my house. You know, John Mayer gave me one of his Paul Reed yeah. Smiths, and it's just beautiful. Nice. Uh, you know, I got a Banker Explore, Karina Explore, just fucking oh, wow. beautiful, you know? Hey, and, you know, just, oh, go ahead. Sorry, man. It's just gear is, to me now, is just, uh, it's just all about, you know, art you know and oh, uh oh, oh yeah yeah no. what well, what well you know the funny thing for me is having been a guitar designer for almost 40 years now and some of the it blows my mind that most of the things that i develop are still selling and i can still walk into a music store and it's like my kids yeah too bad you get a royalty on all the stuff you designed well you know what the thing is that um i seem to be incredibly good at making millions of dollars for other people yeah and that's okay yeah. That's fine with me, you know, yeah. um, except for modulus. I didn't really have a, like a dog in the hunt. You know, I, I work for people, but they supply me with the tools that I need and, and the budgets that I need to accomplish this stuff. So that may, at the end of the day, that makes me happy. But I just wanted to say a couple of really quick things. One is shout out to Paul Reed Smith. Yeah. Paul, he was a local guy in Maryland when I was in Philly. My store was the second Paul Reed Smith dealer in the country, I believe. He brought in two guitars by himself, and I knew him as a repair guy for years. We, I'd send people to him, you know, down there. Anyway, he came in with two of the early 24s, right? Just beautiful. 
But the stuff that was selling was like a single pickup pink guitar with one green knob and a Floyd on it. So the owner of the store goes, we don't have any use for these, man. You know, that kind of natural stuff with the wood is just not happening. Myself and one other guy there who knew the score said, let them leave them on consignment. They won't be here next week. Trust me. These There's some shit here. This is happening. Yeah. We put them in the case. They were gone. And all of a sudden, it's like Paul broke that. He broke the, it's got to look like a Charvel. It's got to look like an Ibanez. You know, it's got to be a hot rod. It can be a beautiful guitar that can do a bunch of cool stuff. And the, the beauty part is cool. My dream, it's, my dream guitar is the Santana Yellow. That's my, oh, yeah. That's my oh. dream guitar these days. I just... The the first two runs of them, you know, the, yeah. the ones that are sharpied on the back and then the next yeah. run, those I think are some of the, it, it, it just killed because it was a totally different guitar. It, it yeah. looked like a, you know, it looked a double cutaway, a little bit of a, a Les Paul double cutaway junior, but then it also kind of looked a little bit like a, uh, it had an arch to it and everything. So it looked like, uh, like an SG 3000, but without the pointy and stuff. But man, I love yeah. that guitar. I love it. And the one well, that John gave me is, is phenomenal, man. But the Santana oh, yeah. Yellow for me is the one. That's man. it. it well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, um, he he basically, like, if you remember the movie The Fly, where the guy gets stuck in, in the machine and he ends up being part fly. He, yeah. I think Paul had that machine and he had a, he had a Les Paul and a Strat. Yeah. And they came out all messed up and they came out great. But I mean, I just want to shout out to the guy because I know how hard it is to start a guitar company from nothing. I also know how hard it is when you know that your idea is going to be right eventually, but people are telling you you're wrong. And Paul just fucking never stopped. And he yeah. was right. And now we have the third great American guitar company that you can debate. There are other great ones out there in this country, but Fender gibson and prs and there didn't used to be prs and i give them a ton of credit and the other thing i wanted to say really quick when you're talking about your favorite guitars people always think i'm going to have some like really trippy guitars my favorite guitar or some like bizarre headless eight string thing or something like that my two favorite guitars that i worship in the entire world are a 50 single cut les paul jr oh yeah and and, and a first or second year 335 long guard oh, yeah. i've owned both of those I grew up around Leslie West when he was Leslie Weinstein. Yeah. And what what you can do with two knobs and one P90 is mind blowing to me. I still find shit in that guitar that all the switching crazy complicated crap in the world just doesn't bring you. And to me, the 335, it's so normal today. That was an insane idea in yeah. 58. That was crazy. It's like, what can we do that nobody on earth can do but Gibson right now? It's like, yeah. hey, what if we had a, took a jazz guitar and shrunk it down, make it thin, and then put a solid block of wood in the middle so it doesn't feed back and you can turn your amp up as loud as you want? Where the hell did that come from? That's a wild concept. I love the 58 Les Paul Jr. TV. I had it. Uh, oh, oh you my know, God, yeah. The yeah. way they turn into that oatmeal yeah, kind of yeah. Yeah. And that 58 was the year where they had the rubber toggle cover instead of the plastic yeah. as they ran yeah. out later yeah. to be seen on the George Benson later in my yes. yeah. you know. <clears throat> and then cool. of course, I think the 52 Esquire one pickup is the oh. rock and roll machine, man, for you know. Oh my god. Yeah. yeah. God, it's great. It's like it's like when I was coming up, like I had a bunch of juniors, so I knew what they could do. But I just I thought like anything besides like doing humble pie covers, I, yeah, I'm not going to be able to use this guitar. And then I ran into Leslie West. Yeah, well, uh, really, really quick. I know we're we're we've been on here for a while, but my my anecdote with him is I followed him around as a kid. I went and saw him on Long Island a bunch of times. I saw the Vagrants. He know, was your he was, Y and T. Yeah, exactly. Right. Nobody knew who he was. He's some local guy. And, you know, he was a pretty scary looking dude. So it was sort of like, well, I'm not going to ask him any questions. So anyway, for years, I tr I went to I went to 48th Street and I tried to buy the Sun Amp that he used because I saw him. I bought the wrong one. Oh, yeah. It was it was like an AC 100. It was louder than hell. No tone. And it broke your face with every note. I couldn't figure it out. So years, decades later, um, in the I go to the elevator at an AM show in Nashville, 
Larry DeMarzio is in there, who's my buddy, and Leslie's with him. Oh, wow. So I go up to Leslie and I feel like, oh, man, this fanboy shit's going to get me killed, but I'll try. I said, Leslie, I've been following you around since I was 16 years old. Your tone eats my brain. How the hell do you get that? He said, I turn it up till my balls bang together and then I know it's right. And then the doors opened and he was gone. And Larry just goes. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's all in, it's all in his hands. It's all in his hands. And I'll tell you why I know that. I played the uh, biker run, the Redwood run, and my yeah. band opened for uh, Leslie West. And oh. he came with no gear. He flies right. in on a helicopter and they go, we need to use your gear. And we just had fucking our gear up there. And he goes into Mississippi Queen and it sounds exactly like a fucking right. 90, but he's playing a goddamn Strat through a fucking combo amp, you know, a, a combo matchless. And he's up yep. there, you know. And so that is the proof. It's same with Billy Gibbons. I've watched oh, yeah. plastic guitars. Everything sounds like... Doesn't matter. Rates. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, th these hey, guys... Yeah. It, it, it was great talking to you, man. And, Thank you. This uh, was really fun. Yeah. I pre I appreciate you talking to me, man. I hope we uh we can informally continue this because obviously we're we're both high on guitars and amps. Absolutely. And, perfect. and well, really uh, yeah. And I want to ask you one question before we leave. Uh I've been going to NAM since the 80s, like you. And uh it's weird what it is now. It, it, it almost seems totally useless with the Instagram world. It's kind of like Rolex going to Basel world, you know, uh, yeah. or watches and wonders and stuff. But the NAM show, it's really kind of sad what it turned into as far as, you know, well, your booth is a million dollars and, and all yeah. of that, you know, um, yeah. do you think, that there's something that can come out later on uh, like a NAM show, but that's fucking hip. You know, I hope so. And I would hope though. I have no way of thinking that this is actually going to happen. They're tr they've tried to put some new blood into NAM. It's really hard because it's an old organization. I just saw where Victor Wooten, Wooten signed onto their board. Wow. You know, they're, yeah, they're looking for some people with some vision and that can widen it. You know, I know the guys that run that. Of course, we all do in this industry. And um, they know, they they know that, you know, the, the viability of NAM has changed drastically after the pandemic. Yeah. We all kind of, we all learned that we didn't necessarily need to be there because it used to be like, oh my God, I've got to get my shit to the NAM show or nobody's going to know I'm alive. Um, I don't know where it's going and I don't know if something can come of it. Maybe they'll join with something else that's very cool. That might be a good idea, you know, join with some like techier stuff that'll bring in like a wider audience. But um, I, I know they're struggling. What you do is a NAM festival. And what yeah. it is, yeah. is it's a music festival and the gear is at the festival, the booths. Yeah, you that know? would be fucking killer. Yeah. yeah. No, so you're seeing some... players, they get to yeah. see them play. It's not like you got to go over to this bar and then across to this convention center and you got to go down around the corner over there. And it's just a festival and it's all the fucking dealers and what there's a, cool a big idea. fucking stage. No, that, that's a really cool idea. Somebody, something to incorporate what these things actually do. <laughs> right. 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 It's like right. instead like of just Coachella, but Nam. Yeah, instead of just looking at it, people are using it, and then you can go talk to somebody if you're like, man, that fucking guitar looks really cool. They're right yeah. there. Yeah. You know, I, I like that, but that fresh blood, something to pump some life into this. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and people today, it's all on your phone or in your computer. So, you know, they don't feel like they need to go anywhere. It's like, okay, let me see what's cool right now. Oh, there's a cool guitar company. They don't need to have it stuck in their face and spend a million dollars to get there. I like your idea, though. I mean, that's something that they should consider is like change the venue and change the function of it, but turn it into something where people really want to be there. Yeah. And, cool. and, you know, get it out of the fucking uh, convention center and get it out like maybe some kind of indoor outdoor type of thing where there's a concert going on. Oh, yeah. Steve Vai's playing at two at, right. at the Gibson stage or Ibanez stage or whatever. And just Definitely. have all these booths and families can go and everything and be like, ah, oh, fucking look at this. Here's the amps and, and all of that, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that creates a level of excitement that they don't have right now. Yeah. Interesting idea, man. Well, yeah. well thank you. Thank you so much.
Great to have you, man. And congrats on the Vox gig. And uh, send me over some photos of that AC-15 that uh, hand-wired. Oh, yeah. I'd like to look at it. I I don't see them in music stores. The only time I ever see them is those used ones on reverb, you know? And it's good to know about that that tube. Stay away from the early ones. unless The F-86? Yeah, if you're going to leave it in your studio or something, they're, they, they're the best. But yeah, it's it's definitely, it's the function of the tube. The structure of it's weak. That's right, all. Right, right. Uh, all right, dude. Wait, one last question. Have you, uh, has anybody seen Mark Sampson around? No, I lost contact with him a long time ago. And I'd love to know what happened to him because he's one of these guys, like he moved on the bad cat and then he moved off of that. And he had some other stuff going on, and I lost him about the third iteration of what he was doing. That's yeah, an interesting from Samson, a uh, bad cat to Samson. Yeah, own. yeah. And then you know, other guys came and just started killing it, also, which was like uh, divided yeah. by twenty two, Fred, and all these dudes. Uh, yeah. Best best amp I ever owned was a divided by thirteen FDR thirty yeah. seven, but he wouldn't sell it to me until one of his artists vouched for me. Oh, wow. And this is my last story. The artist was Henry Kaiser. And I know Henry really well from the Bay Area. I call him on his phone. He's in Antarctica. Oh. He's entertaining people in Antarctica, but he had a satellite phone. Oh, wow. Wow. So I'm like, hey, man, do you think you could give Fred a call? Because he's like just being cautious because he doesn't just want anybody to drop out of the moon and like mess up one of his amps and give him a bad thing. And yeah. he said, Oh, I'll, yeah, I'll call him later today. I'm like, oh, thanks. Well, where are you? He said, Antarctica. <laughs> Holy shit. That's Henry. Anyway, thank you for everything, man. Thanks, buddy. I will see you. I'll see you, bud.